tonight, residents decry a stain on the reputation of Foashu following a viral video of an altercation. Police push back against allegations of heavy-handedness when SSU responded to the Foashu incident. And two repeat candidates and one newcomer are among those announced as UWP candidates. The details of these stories and more are coming up. This is the Hot 7 Nightly News with Lovelace and Amy Jones. Good night. It is Thursday, the 2nd of July, 2020. Welcome to the Hot 7 TV Nightly News on Flow Channel 117, also on KISS FM, our Caribbean Hot FM mobile app, and our Facebook page. I'm lovely St. Amy Joseph. Thank you for joining us. Videos have gone viral on social media showing a web of violence in the community of Foasho on the night of the 1st of July. Hot 7 visited the community today to gauge the mood of residents and to get an account of what transpired. Geneve Gonzag reports. The mood in Poasho this Thursday morning is in a state of calm, a stark comparison to the events that transpired late Wednesday night. We are standing in the direct vicinity of where the web of altercations unfolded and spoke to a resident, and Sitas Valsint, who recounted the events which transpired. Yeah, it was yesterday afternoon. There is two young ladies. I know they in the um, uh, the little problems, but I wasn't expecting that. I was in my kitchen washing some dishes, and I heard a loud noise in my door. When I checked, I saw bottles were um, broken. So I went to the other young lady and asked what was going on. So then the whole altercation started. But I didn't get myself involved. That was going on because. It is high time for people in the community to get them together because the community is too small for people to be divided like this. So the boyfriend for the young lady was outside and I myself was inside when I heard the gunshots and I saw he run inside, inside my home, say he get shot, he get shot. So when I checked, I saw on my doorstep, a back of blood, all inside had blood. But last night we had to clean up because inside was smelling of blood. And a few minutes later, the ambulance and police, they came, they took him to the OKU hospital. Valsent is making a strong appeal to members of the community to steer their children in the right direction. It is high time for adults self. When something happens, they have to try and stop what is going on. Because I wasn't pleased with what was going on last night. And I'm pleasing for, for the people in, uh, at Hospital Road for Asho. Please come together, forget about problems, put all problems on the side because life is too short. So we all are growing ups, we all have children, we're supposed to talk to our children and we're supposed to let our children know what is good and what is not good. If our children do something that is not good, we're supposed to call them and let them know well what they do is not good. So I'm pleading to the people of the area, please, the young men and the young women, please, let's come together and let's make hospital would look better than this because it's not looking nice at all another elder in the community who did not wish to be identified indicated that the incident was not gang related it is alleged that two young women with previous history were in an altercation when the partner of one of the ladies intervened leaving him with injuries we did have some injuries um, presently because it's a investigation, a police investigation. I won't be able to give the full details. He's one of the young lady's boyfriend. He he attacked the other young lady who was beating his girlfriend and found himself getting a little um, <laughs> uh, beating from the community members because what they thought is that he should have assisted in separating the altercation and not add to what was happening. He says while the incident on Wednesday night was unfortunate, it should not be used to stigmatize the entire community. He says many residents are working hard to build and uplift the community. With the viral videos that are appearing on media at the moment with what transpired in the Fuasha area, we the residents would like to let the entire St. Lucia community know that we are back to normal in spite of what transpired yes it was from outside persons the incident occurred and we do not want people to stigmatize the community we are aware of what it used to be and we have developed throughout the years and we would like to continue developing as a community uh, a lot of our young people saw what transpired and they're talking and they're asking questions of what's next and we are guaranteeing as the elders in the community to ensure that 
these situations don't happen again. As much as we cannot control it, but we will do our best as community members to put peace in this community. Reporting from the community of Fuasho, I am Genevieve Gonzaga. Police Press Relations Officer Corporal Ann Joseph says the incident that transpired at Foa Show on Wednesday night is more than what meets the eye and what is being circulated on social media does not tell the full story. She expressed that officers who were called to the scene need to be applauded as they executed their duties professionally. She made those comments against the backdrop of criticism of heavy-handedness on the part of SSU officers. More in this report. Following the incident at Foa Show, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force is addressing claims of heavy-handedness by police. Public Relations Officer Corporal Ann Joseph says at about 7.30 p.m., officers received a report about someone in possession of a firearm with the intent to cause injury. According to Joseph, when officers arrived in the area, there was an initial air of unwelcome as people refused to provide any information to the law enforcement officers. After a prolonged period, officers were able to ascertain information and received assistance from the St. Lucia Fire Service to transport the injured victim to the OKEU hospital where he is still admitted. The special services unit was deployed to assist. On arrival, they were conducting a search of a motor vehicle with some persons that they believed to have been suspected of being involved in the incident. Another male who was not in any way being dealt with by the police, proceeded to threaten the officers and attempt to obstruct them whilst they conducted their duties with those persons. And we must say that the individuals that the police were dealing with at the time were compliant. They did not pose any threat to the officers. They did not resist the, the um, interactions of the police with them. They were very compliant. That individual threatened one of the police officers as well as try to obstruct them from conducting their duties. At that point, an arrest was initiated by one of the officers. The individual proceeded to resist arrest and assaulted one of the officers attached to the special services unit. Two other individuals were also arrested in relation to this incident and charges are expected to be laid on short order. Joseph says, given all the scrutiny the police has been coming under, the officers who responded to the incident on Wednesday must be lauded for their level of professionalism. And the information provided to me by both civilians and police who were present, also the information that is coming up from the videos, and there are various videos, I've seen about eight of them so far. The information from the videos, you can clearly see that the officers exercised a lot of restraint. It's not okay to buoy everything just because there is something going on internationally to say that every single bit of police action is unlawful. And from the evidence thus far, the officers conducted themselves very, very, very well. We must commend them. There is no indication that there was something unlawful going on. And I can understand that you may not like a police officer, but we're executing our duty. Joseph has indicated that more information on the incident will be given as the investigation continues. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Janine Gonzag. The National Council of the United Workers Party on Sunday, the 29th of June, endorsed three candidates for the upcoming general elections. The council endorsed Senator Fortuna Bellrose for the Castries East constituency, Senator Francisco Japier for the Labry constituency, and Farah Polius for the Denry North constituency. According to the UWP, Senator Bellrose has a stellar record as a public servant at the highest level. She currently serves as the Minister for Culture and the Creative Industries. Bellrose served the constituency of Castries East, where she hails from, as the caretaker candidate for the last four years after falling shy of just 300 votes against the leader of the opposition in 2016. The UWP believes that Bellrose has played a pivotal role in building a new St. Lucia and that she is well on her way to gaining victory at the next polls. 
Senator Francisco Chapier has been an advocate for the South in the Senate from 2019. Chapier is a businessman and taxi driver and former president and member of the Southern Taxi Association and a former employee and officer of the Labry Credit Union. The UWP says it is confident that Jean-Pierre has made significant strides towards the development of Lambry in the last four years and that he will be victorious against the incumbent Alva Baptiste in the next election. Newcomer Farah Polius is said to be a daughter of Gardet Denry North. She is an educator, community activist and people-centered leader, according to the UWP. Polio served as a teacher at the Larry Schuss Combined School, Denny Rivier School, and a lecturer at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. She also serves as a tutor and course coordinator in the Masters in Literacy program of the UE Open Campus. Polius has reportedly been at the forefront of water projects in Gadet. She's also led summer workshops and cleanup campaigns in her community. The party says it is confident of her becoming the next parliamentary representative for Denry North at the next elections. To do that, she will have to defeat Sean Edward. Now, St. Lucia has announced revised travel protocols. Geneve Gonzag has more on that new development. Following a reassessment of travel protocols based on market conditions, the government of St. Lucia will introduce several new and updated protocols for arrivals from July 9, 2020. Travelers will be required to obtain a negative polymerized chain reaction PCR test within seven days of travel unless they are arriving from countries in the travel bubble designated by the government of St. Lucia. Visitors traveling only from destinations that have zero or low instances of COVID-19 cases will be exempt from the seven-day pre-testing requirement. Visitors with a travel history from these areas in the last 14 days will also be exempt from quarantine. All visitors and returning citizens to St. Lucia must complete a pre-arrival registration form prior to arrival. Visitors can go to www.stlucia.org and click on the COVID-19 page to find a link to the form. Visitors must fill out details, including proof of negative PCR testing and indicate which COVID-19 certified hotel they will be staying in. All returning St. Lucia citizens and residents must also complete the pre-arrival registration form as above. On arrival, they are required to quarantine for 14 days at a pre-approved home quarantine address, government-operated quarantine facility or a COVID-19 certified property. The new testing protocols are as follows. Pre-testing prior to travel is now mandatory. Visitors must provide a negative test result taken seven days or less before travel to St. Lucia. This comes into effect from July 9, 2020 and will be reviewed after 30 days. All arriving passengers will be screened, including temperature checks at the airport. Any symptomatic passengers will be isolated and tested. They will be required to remain in quarantine or isolation at their hotel or government-operated quarantine facility until the test result is obtained. If the result is positive, they will be transferred to a treatment facility until they receive two negative test results and are clinically stable. Passengers arriving with proof of a negative PCR test may be exempt from on-island testing and advanced through immigration, baggage claim, customs and arrivals for transportation to their COVID-19 certified hotel, pre-approved home quarantine facility or government-operated quarantine facility. Anyone arriving without proof of a negative PCR test will be subject to immediate isolation and testing with possible quarantine or treatment should a passenger test positive at their own cost. For the full list of protocols, visit the government website or Facebook pages. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Geneve Gonzalez. In uncertain times given the COVID-19 pandemic, Independent Senator Mauricio Thomas Francis is appealing for the government to proceed with caution on its capital projects. The Uanora Airport Redevelopment Project and certain road projects, she says, are too grand and need to be scaled back. Independent Senator Mauricio Thomas Francis says as part of the honor bestowed upon her to represent civil society in the Senate, she is mandated to give meticulous review of the budget policies and provide objective and balanced feedback. 
When she rose on Wednesday, she noted that she supports many of the budget policies, but called for reconsideration of some, chief among them being the Yuanara International Airport Redevelopment Project. She called on the government to exercise fiscal prudence and revisit the scope of the project. While she agrees that the airport needs to be upgraded, she's of the view that the project must be scaled back. I think the critical area of upgrade that is needed is the runway and some enhancements to the arrival lounge and the departure lounge. I've seen the plans, the redevelopment plans, and the plans are flamboyant. They are extensive. And no wonder we have to invest so heavily in that particular thrust. Madam President, we have to look at the environment within which we operate when we are making such decisions. Quite apart from the impact of COVID and the issue with how long we will have to wait to benefit from some semblance of economic recovery, you have the issue of technology. Thomas Francis also took issue with the price tag of some of the proposed road works. She says the quoted cost of some of these projects is simply mind-boggling. Millennium Highway, no issue with that because we are aware that there is a need for us to invest in upgrading the road because there's been several accidents there and the road definitely needs some form of attention. Um, but we are spending $200 million, $46 million of which is to build a bridge. To build a bridge in Caldesa and another sum to build a bridge in Ancillary. Madam President, I traverse that road very frequently, at least once a week. And when I look at the bridge in Caldesa, I am no engineer, but I do not understand why the capital outlay to build a bridge in Saudi that has to cost um, $46 million, Madam President, at a time like this. Madam President, it's not too long ago we built a bridge in Bois Orange that cost $11 million on a highway where thousands of vehicles travel every single day, $11 million. The Supra Bridge, which caters for a huge river from our forest, cost about $4 million based on my recollection, and that, that bridge was built not too long ago. The Alba Bridge down in the valley cost somewhere in the region of $5 million. What about that bridge in Caldesa that is costing us $46 million? She calls for a revision of the plans or for more quotations to be invited. She further argues that during such a critical time, any surplus funds should be used to support other sectors within the economy so as to provide much-needed relief to the people of St. Lucia. Prime Minister Alan Shastley announced on his official Facebook page that the NIC Economic Relief Program will be extended by three months until the 30th of September. He explained that the National Insurance Board considered the ongoing adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the business sector, including the hotel sector, which employs a significant percentage of its contributors, having satisfied itself that a sufficiently large number of its contributors would require some relief over the next three months, the NIC examined the affordability of the program. The NIC has reported that the overall cost for a six-month program will remain within the cost originally forecasted as the worst-case scenario for the initial three months. Given those two key factors, the business impact and the cost of the program, and taking into account its mandate to provide income support to its contributors, the board of the NIC decided to extend the economic relief program by three months to September 2020. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. Still to come, the government takes on critics on the HIA redevelopment project. Senator Gibeon Ferdinand wants answers on behalf of Niku and Beanfield Secondary School students and updates on the plans for government's three major water projects. That and more after the break.